I wanted to start by acknowledging that what the church calls good news and what journalists call good news are entirely different things. The Christian gospel, which is a word meaning good news, gospel, is that the creator of all things, God, so loved the world that he gave his only son so that all who believe in him should not perish, but have life now and eternally. To put it another way, God, who is just, provides salvation. And what that means in practice is a worldview that trusts the faithfulness of God. At the same time, Christians live in a God-created community, the church, and that is the rub. The church being full of human beings is full of those who go wrong. The church often seeks to speak truth to power, but we must recognize as different bits of the church, and speaking as the Church of England in England, our own power too, as well as our immense failures and sins. And therefore, we should welcome the challenge and scrutiny from the media that is part of living in a democratic society. And having spent a good deal of my life traveling in places that don't have those freedoms, I know which I prefer. When I started this job just over 10 years ago, the media landscape, even that short period ago, looked different. It has become faster, if one can believe that, more complex, more driven by social media, In an age of misinformation, distraction, and the competition of noise with truth, it is ever more difficult for journalists to do their job. The best account of that I've heard recently was a series of podcasts by Jeremy Bowen that some people may have seen. They make long journeys go very quickly. My approach to the media has developed over 10 years. I take more risks, deliberately rather than accidentally. I try to engage, and I recognize the vital importance of seeking to communicate well what the church is doing and what we actually care about. I try to say yes to as many media outlets as possible, including especially the local and the regional. I know how successful they are because they are deeply embedded in the community. I have a very strong memory of a visit to a particular diocese in the province of Canterbury, which goes a long way north, so you won't be able to guess it, and being asked about what I did I enjoy traveling on buses and what I thought about the bus timetable in that particular town. They were certainly embedded in the community. And they do marvellous things, despite especially at the local level, as we know, being immensely stretched and having had an incredibly hard time in the last 10 years. And I actually quite enjoy interviews, believe it or not, although they make me very nervous. I could sit on the sidelines, and I'm very tempted to do so very often, when knowing that when anything is said in public by anyone, it will be analyzed and instrumentalized. One of the relatively few things I'm looking forward to in my eventual and long-distant retirement is being able to read the paper without worrying about whether I'll see my own name in any context at all. (coughs) There are two aspects to any religious figure's involvement in the media. First, you're reported on for example, after making a speech on the illegal migration bill. Secondly, there is the context of engaging with the media media proactively and giving interviews or engaging on social media. There's a difference. So if we start off with engaging with the media, why do it? And the greatest single reason is that Christian faith claims truth. For Christians, truth is not a concept, it is a person. Jesus, not an idea. When in John chapter 14, verses 1 to 6, one of Jesus' disciples expostulates with him when he says, you know where I'm going, and, and the disciple says to Jesus, we 
I mean, this is the Welby translation, so you won't find it in any published reputable Bible. But uh, basically, the disciple says, I haven't the faintest idea what you're talking about. And Jesus replies, I am the way, the truth, and the life. When Pilate, at his trial, says, what is truth? He's asking the wrong question. He should ask, who is truth? And truth is standing before him, beaten and bloodied, and looking anything but impressive. When I was interviewed by Alistair Campbell several years ago, we talked about his famous phrase, we don't do God. And we talked about the fact that even if New Labour didn't do God, God still does us, and for that matter, New Labour. God's faithfulness and providence is an embracing worldview that is not a private hobby, but a universal principle recognized or not. Terry Pratchett, who one of our sons when a teenager introduced me to and whose books I found enormously amusing, has a book with something in the title about something to do with small gods and the size of the god depends on how many worshippers they have. Well, it's clever and amusing, but it's false. God does not need worshippers, people and creation need God. So if we take the illegal migration bill, for example, I find myself reminded of the passage in Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46, which is about the last judgment. It concerns two groups of people who unknowingly live in a way that either honors or fails to honors God's commands for our way of life in the world. It echoes what's often called the Nazareth Manifesto in Luke chapter 4, verses 16 to 21. These two groups of people, the sheep and the goats, they're called, they either feed the hungry or fail to do so, they nurse the sick, they visit the prisoner, and as we think about the illegal migration bill, they welcome the stranger or they fail to do so. The second group live as though it didn't matter. The first group is welcomed by Christ to eternal life. The second group have to face the terrible consequences of living for their own interests, as though those in need did not matter. Churches are active in this world and in its concerns because they see God being active in this world. And many of those people who call for our help are Christians. Church is over two billion strong in every country around the world. Even the little Anglican communion spans about 80 or 85 million people across 165 countries. And the typical Anglican is a woman in her 30s in sub-Saharan Africa, likely an area of conflict or persecution who lives on less than $4 a day if they're doing well. Anglicans live in the hills of Papua New Guinea. Or they work in the streets of the city of London or in the banks and the dealing rooms. So when I talk about migration or about poverty or conflict or trade or natural disaster or climate change or social justice, it isn't a hobby or a way of filling the otherwise empty days. When I talk about these things, I see in my mind's eye the people I know and love around the world, the people I call brother and sister because we belong to the same family in Christ. Being part of that changes everything. Religion isn't a bolt-on to our lives. It's not an app you can download into the human software. It's the entire operating system. It's the prism through which we see everything else. And though this country may be becoming more secular, or not, as the, world, as the case may be, the world as a whole is not. 80% of the world is religious of the population and going up, not shrinking. So when we talk about religion or religious people, we're not studying some endangered exotica under the microscope. Of course, not all of those 80% are Christians, not even a, a majority. And our relationship with other faiths is very important, as we saw at the coronation. We work closely with other faiths, not just out of a deep sense of hospitality, which is arising from our understanding of the nature of God, but also because other religious groups have a religious perspective that shapes how they see the world. The big help out 
a volunteering initiative on the Monday after the coronation was endorsed by religious groups. And you may have seen the images in the news. Muslims, Jews, Christians, Sikhs, and others of no faith and of other faiths got together. It involved 7.2 million people in this country, well over 10% of the country. It was a project started by the Together Coalition, which I chair. And on that day, Caroline and I served uh, lunch together at a homeless charity. Going back, finally, to what I said at the beginning about good news. At the Lambeth Conference of Anglican Bishops from around the world, which happened for the first time in 14 years last uh, summer in Canterbury, I joined journalists who were covering it at a reception. During that gathering, I said, yes, of course we know there are stories about deep disagreements over sexuality that they would want to report on, and rightly so. They're important issues, and they're a good story. But please remember that at that gathering, I said, are people from war-torn countries and nations, suffering from famine and drought, people who've literally just fled oppression and brutality, people who've come from refugee camps, bishops, representing the most vulnerable people in the world. We'll be talking, and we talked extensively. We spent two hours on sexuality and 10 days on everything else, slavery, injustice, suffering. But we talked most and chose to love one another despite our differences. Please, in your reporting, don't forget the millions of people and the incredible stories that the Christian church, even the Church of England, represents. Because I think that is also good news for all its faults, both for journalists and Christians. So now as I finish, I'd like to turn the tables and ask a couple of questions for you. How do you communicate the worldview of religious people as well as the facts in a way that just doesn't put their religion in a part of their lives? And can you help me through your questions and your comments understand better how we can communicate with you? Thank you very much. Indeed, um, Archbishop Justin, um, do come and take a seat. <laughs> That's what the dentist says, isn't it? <laughs> um, really interesting remarks, I think, that will give uh, all of the journalists here at this very important gathering lots of things to think about in terms of the gauntlet that you threw down at the end of your remarks about how can we help you understand better how you can communicate with us? So there's lots of things uh, for people to think about and perhaps to feed back to Archbishop Justin, uh, which we'll come to in the questions at the end. Um, I mean, it's, it's hard to know where to start, really, because there's so much that you raised within that, not least prospect of retirement, which also gives us a moment to think about your own legacy and where the Anglican communion is at the moment. But as ever, we always do these interviews not in a vacuum against a backdrop of the real world and the real news. Um, so I'm not part of the real world? You are absolutely part of it, which is why I'm going to ask you a question that <laughs> pertains directly to it. Um, we've seen in the news in the past weekend and indeed today, um, and given that you're willing to talk about moral choices made in government, um, it seems clear that Boris Johnson not only parted in Downing Street and potentially in other locations uh, during the pandemic, um, but given the actions, we know we'll get the results of the Privileges Committee's findings uh, shortly, but it seems that they will conclude that he misled Parliament. Um, was this a man morally fit to lead Britain? That's for the parliamentary process to conclude, not me. But there is a moral take on leadership. There's a very there. certainly a moral take on leadership, and we see it. We saw it. It was the key theme of the coronation. If you remember from little Sam, uh, the 10-year-old at the beginning, asking a question to which the king answered, I come not to be served, but to serve, as the King of Kings did. Um, and so the idea of service, of 
as Peter Hennessy put it, leaving the constitution and the country in a better place than you found it as the key objective of politics um, is a moral aim and a moral com it has a, a, a moral foundation and a spiritual foundation. And your conclusion from that observation would be what in what we what we appear to be witnessing with this committee? Well, it's clear that the committee has found in its process, and it's a very good process, and one that you know it's really excellent that there is something like that. Uh, it's found in its process that he or we understand that it has, and forgive me if that's wrong, that he misled Parliament. Now. We all know that politicians may just occasionally have misled Parliament before. In fact, there may, even in this room, be people who are morally not 100% pure <laughs> and upright. Certainly I'm not. Um, but um, we have a... We, I think my first reaction is it's a very good thing that there's a process within Parliament that measures the issues against criteria they're not saying he, the judgment they've come to is he messed their parliament. They're not you know, explicitly examining his moral character. They're saying he's misled parliament and misleading parliament is wrong and therefore there's got to be consequences. Okay. Um, what's your assessment, given that you mentioned how far the media has moved in the last 10 years, the speed of um, judgments that are cast, the way that stories are told. What's your assessment on how religion is faring within that context? Um, and it was interesting earlier this afternoon, there were a lot of questions about, for example, how Kate Forbes was treated by the media um, in, in the summer. What are your observations on that? I think um, that was very much in my mind. Uh, when I was talking about the issue of worldview um, and communicating a worldview. Because uh, we live in an age, um, uh, uh, as Alistair McIntyre wrote in the early 1980s, um, on where philosophically there is no longer in the global north of countries like the United Kingdom, US, Northern Europe, a single worldview that is uncontested within which the debates and discussions take part. And the result is that we have competing narratives of how we live life and what a good life looks like. And with Kate Forbes um, and with others, um, including a past leader of the Liberal Party, as we'll remember, but with plenty of others, there are frequently moments where the worldview they have and the moral consequences of that mean that there are certain things they can't go ahead with, they can't participate in. But do you think she was treated fairly? I mean, some would no, argue... you don't think she I think it was an entire failure of many newspapers and reporters and radio and TV to ex do its job of explaining how this happens, why this view is taken. It's presented as an entirely eccentric view, which if you hold a different worldview, it is. But for many people disconnected with religion, it may well be. And for many people disconnected with religion, it may well be. And they are, it's people are perfectly free to choose not to agree. But surely it is part of newspapers' views to uh, uh, duties to try and explain how that happens. So it's not made as a snap judgment in a pylon of the press. It's made with understanding in which says, well, if that's welfare, it's not one I like. And do you think she was, I mean, it's interesting that um, Hamza Yousaf did not, many would see it, have the same scrutiny that she had. Do you think there was a particular issue around Christianity at that point? Yes. And particularly because she is a member, I think I'm right, of the Free Presbyterian Church. Um, and uh, people didn't challenge him in the same way. Um, and I think there was a noticeable difference in that. 
she was absolutely at the eye of the media storm um, for those weeks ahead of that uh, leadership vote. You, you know what it feels like to be in that position, don't you? Um, and I'm reflecting too on perhaps the media coverage in the last few weeks of the Philip Schofield story. To be in the center of that, um, it, to be in the center of the way the media operates around a story like that is a very particular modern phenomenon. I was just wondering what your own personal experience is of it and, and what you make of it. I mean, I won't get into the debate because you, you've forgotten more about the media than I'll ever know, but um, I suppose I might say, if you say it's a particular modern phenomenon, I might just mention Profumo or someone like that. I suppose I mean, in I, that yeah. sort of... I mean, you've spoken quite vividly recently about cancel culture, yes. a lack of hope and forgiveness, and I, yeah. I just wonder how that fits in that context. I think you're absolutely right. Um, for good and sufficient reasons, reasons I understand, I don't criticise, good stories hang around people, don't they? They're not... Stories that hang only around a concept are incredibly difficult to get across, and they don't work well on television. You need a picture of a person, preferably looking slightly um, harassed or tearful, uh, getting into a car and being driven away at speed. I mean, that's the ideal news shot. Um, I think it is, uh, there is an absence of forgiveness. There is an absence of, of, redemp of the possibility of redemption. So people are treated as though they were the worst villain on earth. And where do you then go when terrible things happen? Where do you, if you've treated um, someone in, you know, sport or something like that as you know, the absolute final say in evil, how do you deal with Butcher? How do you deal with South Sudan or Sudan? How do you deal with five million dead in the DRC, which is never reported, but by war since 1995? There's got to be a point where, I know it, it's just much less exciting, but is it really the most exciting? You know, is, are these parlons always proportional to what the What does time? it feel like when it's you? Oh, well, I suppose it feels a bit like... I'm just trying to think. It, it feels very uncontrolled. There's nothing you can do about it except stick your head down and wait and see what happens. Um, I haven't had the worst of it. I mean, you know, I'm obviously asked to resign quite regularly, but um, um, by the people who are, you know, by my friends more than anything else. But <laughs> <laughs> See where we go by the end of the interview. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, you raised your retirement in your speech just now, so a quick fire. When? I am obliged to retire no later than January the 6th, 2026, which is my 70th birthday, and I'm not going to answer the question any more than that. Okay, so not before then, you don't think. I didn't say that, okay. and I didn't say not. Well, you didn't say not. Okay, well, we'll leave that. You didn't <laughs> deny it either. Um, so... <laughs> no, which means I didn't admit it. That's, you know, this is typical journalism. I mean, a story, I don't know. Nothing. Okay. <laughs> I can so... see ITM this evening. <laughs> Archbishop announces retirement to no, Julie no, Etchingham. No, you're safe. You're safe. Um, so it is a good moment, you know, 10 years in, in office to look at your legacy. You've had to navigate the church through... No, it's not. It's... <laughs> Keep going. I'm, I'm going to anyway. interrupt you as um, much as... Okay, that's fine. I feel um, like ready. You've had to navigate the church through the most incredibly turbulent 10 years. I mean, the backdrop just of political upheaval would have been enough. But we've had a pandemic, the death of the monarch, the coronation, which we'll touch on in a little while. Inside the church, the bitter disputes over women bishops, gay relationships, anger over how you've managed the church in terms of the status of parishes. And in that time, attendance at C of E churches has dropped by a third. I mean, that is an alarming drop. What do you put it down to?
I'm only pausing because I'm sort of thinking about how transparent I want to be, but I suppose I might as well. I'm sorry, Chris, I'm going to be really... <laughs> Chris looks and, immediately uh, worried. Go for it. <laughs> well, first of all, I think it's too early to... You, you know, I'm a historian. Um, it's not history. You can't work out a legacy, certainly for another 20 or 30 years, after, after I'm pushing up the daisies. And, but I'm talking uh, about the facts as they are in the place. The facts though. as they are, the further decline in the church is something that in the end, even if I'm not, and I'm not saying I'm not, uh, but even I, if I were not to be responsible for, I'm certainly accountable for. So that I, I personally, I count as failure. Um, now, lots of people tell me I shouldn't have said that and will tell me I shouldn't have said it, but that, but you, you bear that as a personal... Uh, that's what I feel personally, yeah. Um, I'm not sure I know what else could have been done because in the end, as I said in my opening remarks, the church is not in the hands of indiv individual archbishops. The future of the church, its survival or otherwise, does not depend on archbishops. It depends on God and the providence of God. And over the last 2,000 years, we've been in much worse places than this, infinitely worse places than this. We spent 150 years killing each other over, over the real presence in the, in the sacrament. Okay, but the one recurrent theme, and I suggest one possible reason, certainly others would cite this, is the, the, the sort of endless and deep divisions over sexuality. After a six-year process of con consultation, um, finally getting to that point where the proposals from bishops to allow gay relationships to be blessed in church the first time was put forward. Hasn't this debate cost the mission of the church? For those on the outside, whether they're a people of faith or not, see a church that is completely turned in on itself. And hasn't that affected the mission? Because people on the outside just think, look, why are they endlessly navigating issues that for for an awful lot of people, are completely settled. They see the church on a completely different planet from them. Yes, I agree. And no, I think that's wrong. I'm an Anglican. Uh, why did the Anglican chicken get run over? Because it insisted on staying on the middle line. Um, the, the, are you the chicken, Archbishop? <laughs> I am the chicken. Um, no, Yes, I agree. We are far too inward looking. And that is, that's, that's entirely wrong. No, I disagree, because within the life of the church, care and love for one another means we have to listen to one another and not, as a sort of political party might do, impose one group's views on people who entirely disagree. So, you know, the vast majority of Anglicans across the 85 million of them, the Anglican Communion, would think that even the place we were in before the House of Bishops decision was far too liberal. And to simply to treat them as someone said in uh, a speech, as people who are too ignorant to understand sex is, absolutely unacceptable. They're brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's what was in my mind when I was saying, when I see them, that's what I think. Yeah, but you know what quite a lot of them think of you. I mean, on April the 21st, primates representing large majority of the Anglican community, communion formally repudiated your leadership. With broken hearts, we must say that until the Archbishop of Canterbury repents, we can no longer recognise him as first among equals. It's time for the whole Anglican establishment to be reformed anyway. They've already given up on you, haven't they? Yeah, some of them have, some of them haven't. Some of them, if you're asking someone to repent, actually, you haven't given up on them. You just think they're going in the wrong direction because repentance means turning around and going the other way. But They've gone, haven't they, realistically? No, they haven't, actually. No, um, the one of the groups that believes in this, um, the Anglican Church of Kenya, uh, last week had a meeting at their House of Bishops and said, we are most definitely not leaving the Anglican Communion. So, no, they haven't. Um, no one has yet left the Anglican Communion. Some may, but no one yet has. But as it happens, I entirely agree that the uh, structure of the Anglican Communion needs re reforming. The first thing I did in this job was, with Caroline, we travelled to see every... 
um, the head of every Anglican church in the world in, 20, in 40, 38 countries. And uh, the first question when we got down, got past the politeness bit, that was how do we reform the Anglican communion so it's no longer invariably run by a white guy from England and in a communion that is 90% global south. So this isn't a new thing, and what this has given us is the opportunity to make those very serious changes. And I've said I will welcome that and don't hold on to grip the position of being leader of the Anglican Communion. I mean, you've just had to write a very uh, a letter of great strong rebuke to the Ugandan church over their backing of a new law which criminalises homosexuality and in some cases uh, offers the, set, uh, the death sentence for aggravated homosexuality in their language. I mean, what message does simply sending a letter do and hasn't the response from the Ugandan archbishop really laid bare that these divisions are pretty much irreparable, aren't they? I mean, he, he, he practically accuses you of virtue signaling. Uh, yes, he did, uh, practically, not quite. Um, actually, we also need to be fair to the Ugandans. The issues that they call aggravated homosexuality are rape, homosexual rape and um, deliberate infection with AIDS and paedophilia, which are uh, very, very serious crimes and rightly in this country. And so just that's what I mean by presenting the complexities of the issue and not just damning them, you know, bluntly as it were. I think, and I will defend them on, on something, not on the death penalty, obviously, because I'm against that. In, on anything, but um, you know, a lot of uh, some of that bill was other than people portray it. I do disagree very strongly with the criminalisation of uh, gay people, uh, gay and lesbian people, and uh, the Church of England in the sixties was one of those most advocating for the decriminalisation. We've always held to that since. Um, is it irreparable? No, because of God. Yes, without God, it's irreparable. We're not a political party. The church has been in a much worse place than this. Between 1649 and 1660, um, or 1644 uh, and 1660, we fought a 16-year civil war over much less serious things than that, and the church healed after that. Some would also say, and I'm very keen to take some questions uh, very shortly, um, and we've got other things to talk about, like the coronation, which I'm really keen to touch on. The church's moral voice, how has that been affected by the outcome, for example, of the ICSA inquiry, which was utterly damning on safeguarding in the Church of England? The fact yes. that you have open and ongoing questions about such scenarios in parts of the church, that you have the former Archbishop of York rejecting a report uh, which said he'd failed to act on disclosures, um, in, in which he said safeguarding is very important, but it doesn't trump church law. Where is the church's moral voice when it is under such heavy defeat on issues around such morality? It's a very fair question. Anyone who thinks that the Church of England can lecture from some sort of high moral plane is in cloud cooking that. But it's the church. Uh, well, I know that. Um, and, you know, that's what makes it so awful. That is why it is such a catastrophic and total failure, and the fact that there will always be safeguarding challenges, there always have been, it's the differences now that we're open about it and transparent about it. And if you remember, we, a few years ago, um, when uh, we suspended a bishop for failing to deal with it, and uh, the Archbishop of York has, uh, the former Archbishop of York, Lord Santamu, has been asked to step back um, as which would not have happened in the past. So we are much more strict about it. We're much more real about it. But until we have a fully independent central safeguarding system, and this is not the official view, but it's my view, until we have a fully independent safeguarding system in the Church of England, uh, we cannot hold our heads up. Thank you for being so 
candid in your response to that. I'm very keen to get some questions from the audience, and then we'll return to some other broader issues too. I don't know where the microphones are. Um, there's a gentleman at the front. If each of you could kindly introduce yourselves um, and just let us know uh, where you're from before you pose your questions, that would be great. So just a gentleman in the jacket at the front. Thank you. And then there's somebody in an orange top at the back afterwards. Thank you. Uh, Keith Borges, Wood, uh, President of National Secular Society. And thank you for what you did on U Uganda. Um, I'm astonished at the level of concern bordering on anger in Parliament over the established churches uh, declining to um, enable uh, the officiation of same-sex marriages. And it's a tone that I've never seen before in my 25, 30 years. Um, and it extends, as you know, to the 10-minute rule bill and, and even Sir Tony Baldry saying, what we need is a private member's bill to actually introduce that. And, and I'm, I've heard that there's, there's work being done on that. Um, were that to happen, uh, in a sense, Parliament saying, if you won't do it, we'll do it for you, what would your reaction be? And, and would disestablishment come into your mind at all? Thank you. Can you just define disestablishment for me? <laughs> uh, well, the you need to use the microphone, but I on. need to answer the question you're asking. <laughs> ah, well, that's, uh, uh, I would say that it was the, the, the separation uh, of the church from the state, and it certainly would, of course, involve the um, um, removal of the bishop's bench and, and so much of the law that is... Um, uh, that I'm sure not everybody knows that the church discipline and uh, and the prayer book and everything are as much as English law as the sale of goods act. Would that go far enough? It's a help. I know what you're talking about now. Yeah. Um, no, it, disestablishment is a question for Parliament, as establishment was and remains. Um, uh, we could argue about whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, and there are varied views within the Church of England. I'm not going to say what I think about that. What I do know is God's bigger than that. I mean, it's not going to make any difference to the future of the Church, whether it's established or disestablished. It's in the hands of God. This is what I keep saying. And we mustn't fear the future. One of the great things we do is we get into terrible angst and fear and think it's all down to us it's not it's all down to god and to whom we must be obedient so am i worried by that no not remotely um second am i worried by the political turmoil no i'm not um uh, because um the uh it, it, it's a normal part of church life and has been for the last hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, one of my favorite predecessors, um, Archbishop Tate in the mid 19th century from 1868 to 1881 had five disestablishment bills put forward in the first five years of his primacy. So there's nothing new about this. Um, so no, I'm not worried if they do that, well, let them do it. We'll see what parliament does. Parliament is sovereign. It's entitled to vote on these issues. What the church would then do would depend on our consciences. And in the end, what we think, is, what we, after prayer and consideration, believe is right before God, uh, certainly may involve uh, refusing to do what um, the law says, as it has for Christians throughout history. Thank you very much. And thank you for the question. There's a, a question in the middle. If you just Hi. like to introduce yourself, thank you. I'm Liz Slade, uh, Chief Officer for the Unitarians. We haven't heard very much today about the climate. Of course, it's a hugely significant issue for all of us. And um, my deep belief is that spiritual community is essential for helping us to navigate what is ahead of us. And I wonder, well, it seems clear that in order to navigate the, the deep challenges ahead, there need to be significant changes to our social and economic structures. An organization like yours is obviously deeply entwined with a lot of the systems and structures that need to change. 
um, a small church like the one I work for, uh, less so, but I'm really interested in what you see as either leading very large um, faith groups or very small ones, um, how we can best affect the change to these systems and structures that's needed. Thank you. Um, the Church of England's General Synod, so I can't see where, I couldn't see, oh, where you were. It's a great orange top. In the oh, right, yeah. thank you very much, because of the light in my eyes. Um, um, thank you very much. Um, uh, Church of England did its General Synod a few years ago, about 2021, I think, or well, we can't have had one that year because of COVID, but whenever it was, um, uh, committed itself to being entirely uh, carbon neutral by 2030. And I had a report on that uh, at the end of last week, and we are on target for that. That will involve the spending of hundreds and hundreds of millions of pounds, particularly on schools, because our 4,000, 4,500 roughly schools, um, the buildings are very far from carbon neutral. Um, so that is a very, that is our own contribution. At the same time, we've organized and lead an international coalition of fund managers who are putting pressure on companies analyzed by the London School of Economics to be on the pathway to carbon neutrality, not just the extractive industries, but all industrial companies. And about half of the investable universe is represented uh, amongst the companies that, that uh, are fund where, who have shares held by the members of that coalition. So we're trying to use very practical down to earth things to do. So for instance, Gloucester Cathedral is having vast swathes of um, uh, PV cells put on its roof and we've managed to get English heritage to see that that's a good thing. Um, so that's one thing we can do. We can simply set an example. The second thing is we continue to lobby politically and to work across faiths, not just within Christians, as we did at COP26 and we, um, we will at COP28 and did at COP27. Okay, thank you. I'm keen to get a couple more questions. The lady in the green dress and Hi. set. And then there's a, I think there's a member of the clergy who just had his hand raised in the middle there. Um, I completely understand why the church can feel shy about talking about sexual morality given various scandals, but I feel like it's something I see particularly in my generation, I'm 22, that I think the church can, well I was wondering what your thoughts are, if the church can suffer from being too apolog apologetic about its positions on sexual um, morality given how a lot of women, particularly women my age, really suffer from the kind of the dating culture and the sexual norms and the use of porn and like really broken things in how um, relationships are normalized and conducted in this day and age. And I wonder if maybe you think that the church can maybe speak up more about that. I entirely agree with you. We were talking about it in the College of Bishops last week. And um, I think we do need to be a great deal more open about the basic rules of um, the basic understanding of sexual morality within Christian thinking without sounding as though we're lecturing and all that, but just to be unapologetic about saying we believe in um, uh, that sexual relationships are within permanent, stable and faithful. Sexual activity should be within permanent, stable and faithful relationships of marriage as that is understood in each society. Thank you. There's a, there's a member of the clergy, I think, in the centre there. Thank you. And that's the last question, please, if that's... Okay. Thank you. If you'd just like to introduce yourself. Uh, Christopher Lando, I'm a trustee of the Religion Media Centre. Um, I was interested by your comment about Gloucester Cathedral and climate change. Um, I hear a lot from local vicars who find that and so many other things just incredibly difficult to make happen because of how stretched smaller local parishes are. If you 
we're beginning again. Um, would you focus more on the renewal of the little, the local, the ordinary parishes, which are the backbone of the Church of England, rather than perhaps so much on the flagship projects? That's, it's a really interesting question, isn't it? It's one one that you have received a lot of criticism for, the project mm. of faith groups that aren't parish groups to the detriment of some parishes. What... First of all, just get rid of a myth. Uh, what I decide to focus on is not necessarily what the church focuses on. <laughs> Remember, I'm not a pope. Um, I can't just say this will be done, and that carries the General Synod. In fact, if I say this will be done on the whole, it will be rejected by the General Synod. It's the best way of getting it chucked out. Um, no, I think it has to be a balance. The areas I'm most... I, I, am, I was a parish priest for 10 years. I am absolutely committed to the local, and in the visits I've just, over the last weekend, I made to Salisbury, if you look at what I talked about, it was all about the local, and that you could lose the House of Bishops tonight. I mean, they could all, if we all disappeared in a puff of smoke, it'd be a couple of years before there was any notice, noticeable impact on the Church of England, I should think. Um, whereas if you got rid of all the parishes and the church wardens and the lay people, it would be noticeable in about one second. Um, I think there's, um, it's never as simple as this or that. It's not a binary question. Uh, any more than if I were to ask you in your parish, I don't know what you do, but you may be a parish priest. But if you were, if I was to ask a parish priest and say, are you going to do worship? Or are you going to care for the people in your parish? The answer would be, well, both, of course. What a silly question, Archbishop. You know, standard Archbishop-type question. It's not an either-or. What we have to do is find ways of getting the whole church to live for the flourishing of the whole church. And that means that certain groups that have very large resources should be encouraged to share those resources very extensively of people and of leadership and of money. And that involves uh, things like church planting, church crafting, building new churches. We opened more churches last year than we closed, incidentally. And uh, it also involves in local parishes, I was in a rural parish, not a big city center thing, um, it also involves for the rural parishes where they have enormous weight of buildings and all, putting a lot of extra support into that and simplifying the bureaucracy of looking after them and stopping the business of closing parishes and spreading clergy ever more thinly, but being more open, I believe, to the ordination of those who are the natural community leaders and who are faithful Christians, so that we aim back towards many more parsons in the parish, particularly in the rural areas. But we mustn't forget the outer estates, because in all this talk, so often the outer estates, where there are no community, other communities at all, um, uh, where the desolation, the poverty is extreme, where the only working areas are the food banks run by a few local churches, those actually have a huge call on our money and our time and our energy. And one of the things that I particularly value in the kind of churches, the big churches you're talking about, and I presume you're referring obliquely to Holy Trinity Brompton because it's always taken as the whipping boy, um, that um, where you look at where they're, as it were, they've planted churches in various places, a lot of them, but where those church of, uh, churches have planted has typically been in really run-down outer estates of extreme poverty with really dedicated people moving in and serving their local community as a parish church should do and every member of it, churchgoer or not, which is the vision of the Church of England. So I want to see both and, not either or. Thank you very much, and thank you for all those questions. Um, I'm, as ever, got one eye on the clock in my job. Um, I did want to just talk a little bit about the coronation, um, because, you, I mean, I interviewed you just a couple of days before when the pressure was really on, but there was all sorts of things going on behind the scenes. I mean, it, it, you had a unique view 
on the preparation for that yes, moment. I think I can say um, yes to that. Didn't quite get the crown on straight first time. That's tell me completely a bit about the, untrue. That, well, is, we, that, is, that is defamatory. <laughs> My solicitor will be in touch. <laughs> you did give me a little insight when we were talking before about oh, the preparation. That was stupid, wasn't it? Um, about the rehearsals, because that was practice with the king and queen. Yeah, I was asked around to practice with the crown, the real crown, because we had a sort of um, artificial one of the right weight that we were practicing with beforehand. But this was the real crown, and I was invited round uh, uh, a few days before the coronation, and there was the crown jeweller and um, uh, the people who'd altered the sizing of the crowns for the king and the queen. And we sat; uh, they sat in their bedroom, and I crowned them again and again and again <laughs> and again. In their bedroom? In their bedroom. Well, at least there was a bed there. So... It was a bedroom in Karen's house. I, I didn't think it was polite to ask, is this your bedroom? <laughs> it was definitely a bedroom. Yeah. And then how did, I mean, that is the moment, and we talked about this ahead of the event, but just the knowledge that the eye, I mean, millions, billions were watching that moment globally. Mm. To have, I mean, obviously it was the sacred part of it, but the moment of the crowning itself, Well, there were, what was going through your mind? Well, there was a certain amount of get it straight that was going through my mind. Um, and don't fluff it. But it was actually, there was a little bit of, am I sure that it's the square emerald at the front <laughs> and the oval one at the back? Um, but it was mainly, we'd rehearsed it so often and this is going to sound incredibly trite, but the, I found I was able to be in the moment and just be with the king on this enormously sacred uh, moment for him, but also for the country and so on, um, and enjoy it. And it was a wonderful, wonderful moment. Yes, of course, I wanted to get it on straight, um, what you had to do was put it tipped slightly backwards and then bring it forward hard down. <laughs> and I just had this sort of, you know, I was thinking I mustn't do it in such a way that I sort of crick his neck or, you know, whatever. It, that Not would a great be, start. It would be a really bad start, wouldn't it? Um, but it was, it was an extraordinary, it was an intense moment. It was a thin moment, mm. a thin moment of huge significance and enormous privilege. Just in conclusion, um, you and I have spoken in so many different settings and so many different interviews at different pinch points and different moments of political upheaval, the death of um, a late majesty, the Queen, Queen Elizabeth. Um, I also know that you've carried a lot of burdens in your life. You've, and Caroline, your dear wife, you know, suffered the worst loss imaginable with a child. And I know you've always been so candid and thoughtful when you've addressed that. I mean, is it the case that when you have been through that moment, that deep, deep moment of hardship and pain and suffering, that actually... Um, if you've walked through that valley of death, that there is something that allows you to move forward when things are super hard in this job at any moment. Do you see what I'm sort of I do. looking at? Um, I think it's a really good question. I'm not saying you have to have had huge tragedy to be able to be Archbishop or something like that. Quite the, you know, I'm not saying that at all. But... It is fascinating, the most beautiful, one of the most beautiful of our psalms, the one that everyone, that so, not everyone, so many people know, Psalm 23, mm -hmm. the Lord's my shepherd and I'll not want. Uh, it has in the middle of it that verse that you just alluded to. Um, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, even there, your hand will hold me, your right hand will uphold me. And um, 
I think there is something about the personal experience of the faithfulness of God that enables you to know that in the end, this isn't actually about me at all. It's about God's people around the world in far worse situations than I've ever known or will ever know, and far better ones. And um, it's about the providence and faithfulness of God to his church who rescues us even when we get involved in the most terrible things or do the most terrible things to each other. It's about the love of God in Jesus Christ. And the job of the church is to simply keep on saying that and not to be fearful, not to be frightened, not to be overwhelmed, not ever as Archbishop to think it's about me. It's not about me. It's about me as the 105th with 106 to come in the next few years and just get on and do what it seems that God is leading me to do on each day as best I can. Archbishop Justin, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.